Hey, everybody, welcome to our midweek message. And this week, I want to continue really in uh, the theme of the week, which is Passion Week, as we gear up towards Easter this Sunday. And if I haven't invited you already, 10 a.m., we're live streaming Easter gathering. Make sure you tune in and invite people. But one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, tonight was uh, really what happened right after Jesus has entered into Jerusalem. And he entered in on Sunday, but then on Monday, um, in Matthew chapter 21, uh, verses 12 and 13, uh, we see on Monday, it says this, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And so he's, he's come back into the city. He goes into this temple courtyard, the, uh, actually the courtyard of uh, the Gentiles, and, and he's there, and, and we see him do something that we know he's already done once before. Uh, in John chapter 2, uh, at the beginning of his um, public ministry, he goes into the temple and he does something similar. And so we see that as he goes into the temple, um, and as he's overturning uh, tables and, and, and really calling people out, calling out what's happening, um, we see that he regards the merchants and the customers as both guilty of desecrating the temple. Um, there were items being bought and sold, and, and this included doves and other animals uh, that people needed for sacrifice during this time. And, and we see money changers or, or people that uh, would, were currency uh, exchange agents. And, and they were needed uh, because Roman coins and other forms of currency weren't uh, considered acceptable for temple offerings. And so uh, literally these merchants and money changers were charging such excessive rates uh, for people in this temple marketplace that, that he literally says the atmosphere here has become a den of thieves. You're ripping people off. And can you, can you imagine a worse place to be ripping people off at and, and using people at a time when they needed these animals to sacrifice? And not only is Jesus physically doing this, not only is he overturning these tables and, and all of this, but we also see that he's preaching at the same time. He's quoting to them Isaiah 56, 7, uh, and Jeremiah 7, 11. So not only is he doing this, but he's preaching to them. He's calling out what they're doing. Um, and, and it's so funny, when I was reading this, uh, it reminded me, as a, as a kid growing up, one of my friends, uh, his dad, when he would spank him, would quote verses at him while he was spanking him. <laughs> And I always w thought that was kind of funny, and I would always laugh as he would tell me how his dad was quoting verses <laughs> to him as he was spanking him. But I look at this setting, and I go, man, Jesus is disciplining, and he's calling this out while, uh, while he's quoting verses to them. And, and we see, you know, sometimes Jesus used illustrations, but sometimes Jesus was the illustration. You know, sometimes he talked about power. Other times he demonstrated his power. Sometimes he would, he would preach about compassion. Um, but we also see that he demonstrated compassion. And, and, we, and we actually read after, and this is what I really want to get at uh, this evening. Um, we read that after Jesus drives out the money changers, and we, and we actually pick up um, in, in the same setting in, in Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 47 through 48, after he has just driven them out, uh, it says this, And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on to his words. So it says that, they were trying to destroy him, but they could not find a way. Why? Why, why is that? So they're trying to destroy him. They're trying to figure out a way to take Jesus down, but it says they couldn't find a way. Why? It says because the people were hanging on to every word he said. Okay, the people were hanging on to every word that Jesus was saying at this point in time. 
So as a result of that, the enemy, it says, could not gain a footing because the people were hanging on to every word of Jesus. Um, and, and if you read further into Luke, you see that these religious leaders, they keep going after Jesus. Like they don't relent. They don't like, oh, he's got us. No, they like, they, they, they start asking him these different questions in order to trick him, in order to trap him. Uh, they they, they um, make accusations against him. But we see that the people, even in all of this, are still hanging on to Jesus' every word. As, as we see Satan trying to use these religious leaders, which is crazy, as we see him try to use these religious leaders to bring Jesus down, we see that it's not working. And it's not working to such a degree that Satan decides to take matters into his own hands. And what we see is in Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6, after they have tried all these things to trap Jesus, to get him to fall. In Luke chapter 22, 1 through 6, we read this. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. So, so what do we see? First of all, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, but but they're afraid of the people because the people um, are not giving any ground to anything that's outside of Jesus's teaching. They're hanging on to his every word, and so then what does it say happened in verse three? We see Satan himself enters Judas. Ooh. Now, this is not uh, a teaching um, on you know, people being uh, possessed by demons and all that. Uh, But what we do see is we see Satan once again uh, trying everything he can to destroy what Jesus is trying to do. And he's saying it's not working because the people are hanging on to Jesus's words. And so what he does is identify one of Jesus's followers has a void in their life has a void that they haven't allowed Jesus to fill. And he knows, Satan knows, that this void with Judas is centered around money. He knows that when it comes to money, that Judas has not allowed Jesus to gain any any entry into that. In fact, we know that Judas was actually stealing from Jesus. And so uh, we see that all Satan has to do uh, in order to to cause this chain reaction of events to take place is to just place this little thought, to plant this little thought in Judas's mind into the void that Judas has, right? Because he's got a void. There's there's a place in his heart that he has not allowed Jesus to, to take. He hasn't given Jesus full control, full access. And so there's spaces that the enemy has identified with Judas, and so he goes into that, and he occupies that. You know, we are all right now being faced with a lot of voids in our lives, and really, maybe for some of us, it's unprecedented. How many voids, when we think about just our daily activity, our rhythms, the voids that are in our lives, people that used to be a huge part of our lives, our church, all these things that are now voids in our lives. And the question that we have to ask during this time is who or what do you want to fill those voids? Jesus wants to fill your voids, but if you don't allow him to, there's somebody else who's also looking to fill them. Do you understand that it's when the disciples stopped hanging on to Jesus' every word that the enemy was given a voice, a seat at the table, the ability to influence? How many times do we see people uh, allow culture or, or their circumstances to dictate how they will receive and respond to Jesus' words? And what happens as a result of this? What happens is, 
is we start to develop selective listening with Jesus. Because we're, we're, we're allowing these other things to happen and we're, we're giving, we're giving, and, and, and in fact, we're giving the enemy a lot of times a voice in the matter and, 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 or something else or someone else. And, and what happens is we start to have these different gaps that, oh, this is some of Jesus. Oh, this is some of, of, of a friend. This is some of this, and this is some of that. And what happens is we start to pick and choose the things that we want to fill these voids that we have. Um, and in reality, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we start to only pick and choose or selective listen to the things that we like that he says, the things that we agree with, the things that, that we say we actually uh, want out of this. But uh, it's a dangerous thing. And we selective, uh, we're selective in our listening, uh, not only with Jesus. We, we do this, like if you're married, you probably do this with your spouse sometimes, I'm guessing. Um, we do this with our kids. In fact, my wife says I have a special talent for it with our kids. She has no idea how there's time she goes, like, she'll say, how are you not listening to this? And I go, I don't know. Um, but I have developed, and it's not a good thing, selective listening sometimes with even my kids. And what does selective listening really mean? Well, it means we take in some, but not all. And... The danger with that is, once again, we will do this with our relationship with Jesus. We will take in some, but we will not take all. And it's in those voids that we don't allow Jesus to fill, that the enemy is looking to fill. And he wants to infiltrate, he wants to occupy, and then he wants to distort. And it's it's at such a level of importance for us that we see this leads to Jesus being put on the cross. Do you understand that? Do you understand how important it is to identify what you're doing with these voids and the voids in your life right now? Do you understand how important it is, it really is, to ask who or what are you choosing to occupy those voids that you have? Um, because once again, uh, the enemy, uh, Satan, is not looking to just, uh, you know, have this little place. No, what he does uh, is, is literally he expands uh, what he wants to do. And, and, and once again, it starts with a thought, uh, a, a substance or something like that, a situation, a circumstance that he takes. And then he's not content uh, with just planting that. No, no, no. He wants to bring it to fruition. And that's what he does with Judas. And, and he does this in our lives all the time. And some of us can point back to these moments that we've had, these voids that we've allowed him in to, and we've seen the destruction that it can cause. It reminds me of our, our one-year-old. Our one-year-old, every time my wife and I are hugging, uh, he will come and he tries to squeeze himself in between us because he's the baby and he's jealous. And then he tries to literally create distance between my wife and I so that we're focused on him. That's what Satan wants to do. That's what he wants to do in our lives. That's what he wants to do with these voids that we have. And so the question is, whose words are you going to hold on to? Whose words, whose, whose heart are you going to allow to fill the void that you find that you have in your life? And, and, and is, the, is, is the void going to be filled with the voices from CNN, from Fox, uh, from a social media influencer, um, from, from, from a pastor, uh, from maybe even your own words to yourself? But who is it going to be? Whose words are going to occupy? Whose words are going to uh, fill that void? And, and that's something that, that I just, uh, you know, I'm sharing all these things that, that honestly God's been doing in my heart and my life during this time. And this has been a monumental thought for me. And it's really been changing the course of, of how I've navigated through this difficult time. But I just cannot stress enough uh, the importance of these voids that we have in our lives and how we utilize them. You know, Easter is this Sunday. And the, the question that I have for you is to think about people who right now have a void in their life for the gospel. And I want you to really think about some of these people and uh, that, that you have been uniquely placed in their life to invite 
into our Easter gathering at 10 a.m. this Sunday. What an incredible opportunity. It really is. Every year it's an incredible opportunity. And what if, just, just maybe, what if God actually wants to use our church this year to reach more people as a result of us not being able to do it at Matthew Knight Arena, which we had planned? What, what if actually we're able to, because of God, able to reach more people this way? What if, as a result of us not being able to meet in person, what if somebody's going to respond to the gospel that wouldn't have in person that will now because it's online? What a different way of thinking about it. What if there's somebody who's going to actually receive your invite and tune in at 10 a.m. and they wouldn't have gone in person, but they will because it's online and they receive Jesus? What if it's about that one person? And so I and, and so I want to encourage, I want to challenge us, you know, and, and during this week, we're going to be putting stuff to help you invite people. And I want to encourage you, invite, post, text email, uh, phone call, whatever it takes, invite people and take some risks in how you invite people. I've been trying to think of people that I haven't invited before. I've also been trying to think of people that have denied the invitation to church before, because guess what? There's always great excuses on Easter and family things. Uh, this year, guess what? The, (laughs) the deck is cleared. There's not all these activities. People are all in the same place and they're looking to occupy time. They're looking to fill these voids. Let's give them an opportunity to fill the void with the gospel that's going to be preached this Easter, this Sunday. This is a different year, a unique year, but what an opportunity. And just maybe this Sunday, Jesus wants to bring freedom into confinement. And you're like, wait, that doesn't sound good. No, no, no. What if even through the confinement, Jesus is able to bring freedom? freedom so that people who are depressed, discouraged, wondering what is going to happen, actually experience the freedom that only Jesus can bring in that confinement. I'm praying for that, and I'm praying that God can use me to be a part of that, and I know he wants to use you to be a part of that. Let's be inspired. Let's move forward this week, and uh, and let's approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing uh, that we have a Savior that wants to meet us in our time of need. Amen. God bless you.